Okay, it is 7.12, I promised. Thank you. It's awesome to see so many people here. I'm Peter Vandermark, and I'm speaking on behalf of PS21. We're a small, completely volunteer, nonprofit group that aims to present ideas and encourage discussion and policy development around planning issues in Portsmouth. Our goal is to support the creation of a vibrant, sustainable, livable, and walkable community capable, um, capable, community, capable, with principles of smart growth and historic nature of Portsmouth in the, context, in the context of the 21st century. That was from the website. In short, what we're trying to do is open up the conversation around some of the challenges we're facing as a city grows bigger and bigger, as we've all experienced, and to hopefully help us all think a little out of the box. Last year, we had eight events, including speakers, workshops, tours, a film, and a book discussion, covering or uncovering walkability, transportation, parking, and form-based zoning. This year, we are planning the same range of events, only this time architecture, affordable housing, climate change, and tactical urbanism will be the topics. It's been our, our intention to make all these events free and open to the public, so any financial support you can give us is much, very helpful. We'd like to thank the following local businesses that have supported us. Please hold your applause. We've been supported in our general programming by the Piscataqua Savings Bank, thank you, and the Seacoast Rotary Club. Tonight's event sponsors are Lassell Architects and Many Penny Murphy Architecture. Our media sponsors are the Seacoast Media Group, The Sound, free and independent news for the Seacoast, and the Corway Film Institute, which incidentally is videotaping this talk and making it available on our website, along with all the other talks that we've had at PS21, at ps21.info, I-N-F-O. Corway has also agreed to act as our financial uh, fiscal agent, and so anyone who would like to make a tax-deductible contribution, that is a possibility, too. The 3S Art Center has been particularly generous, um, hosting us now, I think, for the third time with a discount. So please support them, become members, dine next door at the Block 6. I'd also like to send a special thanks to uh, Green Rides USA of Exeter, who at the last minute provided us transportation uh, for our speaker from his home in Cambridge. So thank you, Green Ride, and everybody else. Please. Okay, so now I want to introduce Mr. Michael Lassell of Lassell Architects in South Berwick. Lassell Architects is the sponsor for this event, and Mr. Lassell, it turns out, is a huge fan of the speaker. Thank you. Good evening. We're very pleased to have Robert Campbell here this evening. He, among, he is among many things an architect, a teacher, urban planner, poet, writer, photographer, and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and, a, and a, the Academy of Arts and Science. Many of you know him through his writings and articles in the Boston Globe. His writing has critically analyzed our cities and towns, helping us to understand what makes them livable. Good architecture and urban form transcend time and location. In Robert Campbell's and Peter Vanderwalker's book, Cityscapes of Boston, an American City Through Time, they explore Boston growth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. With humor and insightful analysis, they write and show through old and new photographs how neighborhoods have been saved, been made better, and have just lost their sense of place. They note it is the complexity and layering of architecture and landscapes that creates the richness of place. In a question posed to him about architecture, Robert Campbell says, it's what we live in. It's what our community is made of. It's the only inescapable art. Architecture is the art of making places, whether those places are dining rooms, boulevards, the Central Park, or the city of Venice. They're all places, they're all made by human beings, and they're all architecture. Our communities are in transition, and change is happening at a pace not seen in many years. 
Our best urban places reflect a variety of architectural styles and layering of uses created over time. Changing building types and uses along with the evolution of the street for the automobiles has significantly impacted the fabric in our communities. As our communities change and grow, we need to discuss density, mix of uses, and scale. These are the elements that reinforce the community's fabric and makes them sustainable and livable. We need to discover the patterns of development within our communities, strengthening the good and changing what does not work by creating outdoor rooms reflecting our time for future generations to enjoy and build upon. Here is Robert Campbell. <laughs> is that okay? Sounds too complicated for me. Those two. I intended to burst through the curtain like Johnny Carson, but they for forgot to supply the golf club. Um, you've just heard everything that I would possibly want to say. Uh, I want to I just want to thank you all for turning out. I think it's wonderful. And if you can't see the screen, you've got a problem because this is always all going to be images. So if people want to squeeze more toward the center, I realize there aren't very many spaces. Uh, that might be a possibility. Um, the basic concepts of architecture uh, don't relate to any one building or any one situation. And what I've tried to do is put together an exhibit of images, which we're about to see, that raise the issues. Uh, you won't recognize most of the buildings, but I think you'll recognize the issues that they raise. The slides tend to come in pairs, and I'll go one and then the other one and then the other, if this doesn't totally confuse me. Um, and uh, I think uh, the two things that uh, you just heard are two that I would repeat because I've spent a lot of time thinking about them. Architecture is the art of making places. It's not the art of making objects. It's not the art, art of making anything else. It's the art of making places. And places can be your bedroom all the way up to Central Park, as he said. And I think that's very important. It's very important to see architecture that way if you want to understand it and not see it as sculpture. And so much of writing about architecture and so much of the theorizing by architects, most of which you hopefully have missed, um, <laughs> deals with architecture as if it were a form of sculpt sculpture, as if it were uh, another art like the other arts. It's not like that. Buildings are all, a, a building remains in one place. It doesn't travel around like a painting in a frame or a sculpture in a box. A building is in one place. So what it does for that place on both sides of it, around it, is at least as important, probably more important, than whatever it does for the people who are going to be inhabiting it. And so I, I'm going to try to make some of those points with these slides. And um, can people, let's try the first one, see if people can see. Well, that's good. It's small. I'm glad. <laughs> Is the lectern getting in anyone's way? Can somebody come help me? Someone much younger and stronger. Oh, you don't think it's possible? Well, do the best you can. Um, anyway, slide number one. Anyone going to tell me where we are, what it is? What? Louder. It's a beach. It's not a beach. <laughs> it's a paved surface. Uh huh. If you want to see St. Mark's Square, <laughs> that's St. Mark's Square. Uh, this is a pair of slides like the other pairs that I'll be showing you. What does this slide tell us? We are lost beings. There is no north, no south, no east, no west. We are at random in the, in the solar system. We don't know where we are, where we're going, who we are. There's nothing, there's nothing to place us. Architecture is the art of making places. There is no place. On the other hand, everything about this slide says this is for human beings. There's a north, a south, an east, and a west. Each of the changes in material is just about the length of a human stride. It's made 
it, it does all those things the other one doesn't. It says, here is a place where two paths cross. You are somewhere. You are not nowhere. You can, you can measure out the space that you're in. You can relate to it. So my argument of these two slides is simply, what a difference a little architecture makes. Another of my favorites, postcard from uh, Governor Rockefeller's great gift to New York State. The, uh, what, is, what do they call it? The, pardon? The what? Egg. Oh, the egg. One of them is an egg. The, the egg is a, uh, it's the, uh, I want to say Thomas E. Dewey Thruway, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's the Governor, Governor Rockefeller's gift anyway. Um, I ask you to look at this one the way we looked at the last slides. What are we looking at? Who are the inhabitants of this site? Enormous aliens who have just striding through this empty space. I could have been photographing this empty space for the last slide. Um, but it's also, it's a concept of city making that a lot of people really believe in and that you have to sort of cleanse your minds of because it's so common. The theory here is that urban design is a still life of objects. It's not about spaces. There are no spaces here. Uh, spaces are only the in-between places. And when I say it's a still life, you ought to think of Cezanne. Um, the, uh, I got, I'm trying to find my, just keep up with me. There we go. The bottle of wine. Think of a Cezanne still life. The tabletop, <laughs> the pile of books, the bowl of apples. All right. It's an under understanding of the city as a beautifully composed, maybe, um, still life of objects. And uh, that is not what it is. There's no, there's no place for the people to be here. I give a, uh, my examples are all unfair because they're all trying to make very clear points that probably aren't so clear. But who can tell me where we are here? Educated audience like this. You're all very close. It's Oxford, yeah. You, I'm sure somebody said that. What's the difference? A still life of objects, a network of spaces. Um, there you go. Uh, if you come through the entrance here, the entrance is celebrated by the tower. You come into the quad. The quad is an outdoor room. The buildings are there to be the paneling of that room. And when you come to the center, you realize you've arrived, and uh, you know where you are. And the, the city is made not of objects. The buildings are perfectly wonderful, but they're not the primary uh, elements that are making this. It's the spaces, the squares, the rooms, and the corridors, which are the streets. Uh, and I just pass that one on. Isn't this the way we see cities so much now? The great objects by the famous architects, one after another after another, without the coming together to make a humane place, a humanly scaled place, and a place that demonstrates the craft of building, which this doesn't at all. And lack of proportion, lack of proportion. Lack of proportion. Please all shout out your comments as we go on. <laughs> We, we, I, I talked about human scale and lack of proportion when we looked at Venice and, uh, well, you'll all recognize this one. This is, of course, my dining room table set up for <laughs> Thanksgiving. And uh, it's an example of urban design. And I can prove that by showing you Commonwealth Avenue. And a great photograph by my often uh, cohort, uh, Peter Vanderwalker, whose name is often confused around here, I understand. Uh, look at the Commonwealth Avenue is an outdoor dining table. And instead of the plates and dishes on the table, the, we have plants and statues and things like that. But people are drawn up on both sides, and they're wearing their fancy clothes on that side of the house because they, it's a formal dinner. And uh, it's an example of, I, I don't want to exaggerate that everything has to be this way, but it's an example of how Urban design becomes a living space and becomes a living space that is, in its way, proportional to 
the dining room table. I love this photograph. Uh, Peter is, without Peter, I would be nobody. Without me, Peter would be nobody. <laughs> okay. Frank Lloyd Wright, Taliesin and West. Somebody got this one right away. Um, it is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who, like all very creative people, was uneven, and you can knock some of his things he did, but he was a fantastic architect and a fantastic everything else, book designer and sculptor and urban designer and uh, everything he attempted. He knew all the materials and all of the, uh, he knew how to put them together. Unlike a lot of architects, he could be the builder if he needed to. Anyway, this is the drawing, oops, sorry. This is the drawing room, drafting room, Italias and West. It is not, it's Italias and East. There we go, this is Italias and West. Notice how carefully it's adjusted to the climate. It's the desert. It's to, near Phoenix. Um, the north side windows let light in without glare. The south side windows have sunshades that prevent them from uh, pr sh shooting glare into the room, and they bounce their light off the shelves, off light shelves on the outside there. So it's, and then the ceiling is translucent, so light comes through there. And there's a kind of a, a magical, uh, irredeemable quality between the building and the site. Uh, this is a building that is only appropriate for this site. It was originally made of canvas. It was originally a tent, and it gradually was improved over time. But I just want to point out the north-facing windows, the translucent ceiling, the south-facing windows, how appropriately they're all organized. And then this is another Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, if we could lose a little more light, that would be helpful. Uh, this is the drafting room at Talias and East in the woods of Wisconsin. What do we have here? We have... I'm <laughs> killing myself here, right? <laughs> um, a forest. Uh, the building is spanned by trusses that are powerful wood trusses that span across here that let light through the way trees let light through in a forest. Uh, the materials are wood. Um, it is as appropriate to the Wisconsin woods as Taliesin West is to the desert of Phoenix. By the way, if I'm not talking loud enough, somebody should tell me. Um, I'm told that sometimes. These are both wonderful rooms, uh, both masterpieces of architecture. And uh, I won't talk about them anymore, but the lessons to be learned from them are just endless. Another of my favorite places, this is you won't recognize this because you're too young. Sixth Avenue between 43rd, 42nd and 43rd Street, I believe. I could be off by a street. Looking west toward Times Square. Um, I love this block. Don't you feel you could buy anything on this block? Uh, it's a pho well-known photograph that was taken about 1940. And uh, I just, this, it, th I saw this in downtown uh, Ports Portsmouth, um, you have a downtown. You have an active frontage on the sidewalks. You have a living downtown. That's what this is. It, it, every, it's, you talked about scale. Everybody is in scale with these. It's full of captions like a cartoon, you know, to tell you what everything is. There's something going on upstairs. That's where the shrinks and the dentists hang out, but the <laughs> retail stores are down here. Look at that same side today. Same block. Um, one door, whole block is one building. I probably should have got a slide that would show that better, but it is, there is no street life, there is no activity, there is no interaction between the building and the larger city and the larger public. And uh, this is the, it's now moved, but this was when I took the photograph, the in, um, International Institute of Photography. And uh, they have exhibits in there. And in their collection, they hold this building. This photograph. I love it. I don't say that one wants to necessarily imitate this, but one should imitate the intention of it. Anything can happen anywhere in a city, and that's the magic of New York. Every city has its own DNA, and the DNA in, in New York is not that you can have powerful LAs with monuments at the end of them like Paris. Uh, it is a grid, and anything can happen anywhere. And you can have a 60-story tower next to a one-story pizza stand, and that's New York, and it's just fine. And th that's what you have here, the sense of 
everything crowded together in one place so you can find everything at once. My son, when he moved to New York, called me up and he said, I don't have to go past the corner to buy anything. <laughs> oh, I love this. You can go to any city in America and stop the first person you see and say, isn't it terrible about the telephone building? And he will, that, that person will say, oh my God, I don't know how we did it. This is the telephone company, whoops, I keep pushing the wrong one. Telephone building in Atlanta, Georgia. And I love it. I mean, I've never seen a building that was so clearly defining its purposes and its architecture. Um, it is, we hate the city and we're going to fend them off before they invade us. <laughs> The sloping tank traps. <laughs> the overlook here where the guys with the boiling oil can drop them. <laughs> um, nothing about this. It couldn't be more boring, huh? Even um, people who try to make these kinds of things, which they probably shouldn't, they will usually at least try to plant two or three trees, but nothing <laughs> like that. That would interrupt the tanks, I guess. And here we have another example of something similar. Uh, this is the, uh, the train station at, uh, at uh, whatever the stop is, uh, the, the channel, you know, that comes into France. What? It starts with an L? Not Lyon, no. Shout! No, not La Havre. This is where you get, off, you get off your train to go to Belgium or you continue on your train to go to Paris. And, that's right. Um, thank you. Um, I've reached an age when uh, my short-term memory is uh, competing with my long-term memory for disaster. <laughs> uh, but this is just, these are famous architects. These are, uh, the master plan was by a famous architect. It just seems to me they couldn't have got everything more wrong than they have. This is the railroad station, which is quite a good building, the only one that nobody's showing off with. This one. Here are the people, right? This, this, is, this is the space that has been created for human beings and who are pedestrians who want to have sodas. And how, who are the, again, who are the real inhabitants? Well, they're these guys, these jackbooted Nazis that are. <laughs> how is it possible? I don't get it. I don't understand how it's possible. Uh, again, yeah, I could, and I pr probably could get it. Yeah, let me do that. Um, this is another example of a facade, a little bit different. We're in Hong Kong. They are demolishing all these buildings now, but they're wonderful buildings. They are walk-ups that are often 12 or 14 stories high, uh, whatever, which is about what this one is. Um, they are typical housing in Hong Kong before they built what they build now. And it's just always a square block. I'm going the right <laughs> Somebody just quoted Stephen Colbert and said this program is going to go on too long. Probably true. Um, think of this as a four-sided square with an open to the sky atrium in the middle. So this is one side. And uh, Hong Kong is very hot miserably hot. And what happens is that every apartment has a, por a, 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 a little uh, porch sort of facing out with screened windows inside. And when you go through the apartment and, and you come to the atrium in the middle, the door to the apartment is mesh and allows air through. So what happens is the air comes along. It's sucked up by the uh, elevator shaft kind of a the, the verticality, any architect can tell you, um, the verti verticality that will draw the air upward in the middle of the building. And in drawing the air upward in the middle of the building, it will draw the air across these little balconies where two things happen. They either hang their laundry, uh, which dries with the air and is therefore cooled by the air, or they put uh, plants. Uh, and uh, plants become uh, shading devices and also oxidize, add oxygen to the air as it goes through. Every indigenous kind of architecture has this kind of subtlety, and, and igloo is the same way. It's unbelievably well adapted to the materials and technology available. But this makes a beautiful facade in which everybody has a different piece of it. 
And if you know what's going on and realize what the, the oxidized, cooled air is going through here and going up, it's wonderful. I always have a contrary example. Here we are in Hong Kong today. Whoops. Here we are in Hong Kong. <laughs> here we are in Hong Kong today. Um, everything is air conditioned. So there's no need for, you don't want the air to come in. You don't want those balconies. Uh, so you just build a building like this one that has no, absolutely no street presence whatsoever. This, I guess, is the main entry. Wow. Um, I, I have a theory that with every advance in technology uh, that I know of, there has been a loss of sensual experience of the world. Um, if you think of uh, oh, the fireplace in the Duke's uh, great dining hall back in the Middle Ages, you know, where the serfs sat at one end of a huge table and the Duke at the other end and the s musicians were around. An, an enormously vital physical experience. And then someone invented the fireplace and people began to draw off into subsidiary rooms that had their own fireplaces. They didn't need the huge fire that was in the Duke's ballroom. And then next, next generation, you're on a... You're on a horse, you're on a train, let's say, and the world is going by as a slideshow. Uh, rectangular images going by one after another. You're that far from sensory experience. Now you're in an airplane, you don't even have that. You have an actual screen with an actual movie on it. And now you're in a spaceship and you don't even have gravity. And I think every kind of transition, and uh, certainly true, I miss my typewriter. I miss all those sensual experiences. I miss the click. I miss the ribbon uh, that smells. I miss the little bell that rings at the end of the line. Those of you who are too young to know this have no idea. <laughs> and you could see the keys. The keys were hidden away in some electronic wonderland. And if you got one that, that was bent the wrong way, you could reach down and bend it back. Um, I think that's a rule that we should apply in life generally now that we're seeing such issues as energy issues and global climate change and things of that kind, to think of the fact that maybe we paid too high a price for convenience. Air conditioning is very convenient, uh, but it's also very harmful, and it also destroys urbanism. Oh, I better go backwards again. Uh, one of my own drawings. Um, uh, he's not very popular because he was a Nazi, but Martin Heidegger was a great philosopher of the 20th century who wrote brilliantly about architecture. And one of the things he emphasized was the, the earth and the sky don't really exist until the house is placed. I think that's very important to realize. The house draws energy from below, which it certainly does, and it creates the sky as the frame around it. Without the house, there is nothing. Uh, and you have to think of houses that way, not only as accommodation to live in, and no, 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 not only as making streets as, as they connect up with each other, but also having this this uh, almost uh, uh, almost religious kind of attitude, I think that's very important. And I will show you another of my famous drawings, um, just to, just to show you that I used to be able to draw. This is, the, of course, the uh, Jefferson Memorial in Washington, and uh, uh, it's the same thing, isn't it? Uh, the 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 dome of the building reflects the dome of the sky. Uh, the, uh, uh, the columns are like trees that are holding it up. It's, things are growing out of the ground, uh, pumping energy into it. And all those things are present here. Without this building in sight, the duck wouldn't mean very much. Uh, without, the, without the building, it's not that we just want to look at the building, it's that we want to look at the building as something larger and what it does for it. Uh, every, everybody recognize this one? Another of my drawings. It's another one of your buildings. It's what? It's another one of your buildings. It's, it's, something, <laughs> it's something that uh, you've all been to. What? White House. White House is close. It's Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, this is the governor's, whoops, here I go again. Okay, 
I will try to do better. The Governor's Palace, the College of William and Mary, the uh, Parliament House, whatever they called it, I there was some other name for it. And it's on this kind of uh, T-shaped uh, corridor. And these are all shops and houses. And these are the three powerful sort of anchoring elements. Well, what else is it? It's also, somebody pointed out, it's Washington, D.C. There's the White House. There is the Lincoln Memorial. There is the Capitol. And uh, it's exactly the same idea. I'm interested in the, I, the fact that there is a kind of DNA under the surface of a culture that begins to reproduce the same kind of ideas, because what else is it? It's a third thing. It's not only Williamsburg and Washington, D.C. It's also a shopping mall. There's Jordan Marsh. There's Sears. There's the restaurant. And here are all the little shops that depend on them. Same exact pattern. Um, there's something, something about that I don't know. But I'm, going, I'm going to try and hurry up a little bit here. Can, can people hear me reasonably? Yes. OK. Uh, another uh, pair of drawings of mine. Uh, and you, you're all familiar with this, I think, because you've all thought about urban design. Um, there are two ways you can lay out an, a residential or an urban area. You can make a grid, and you can make a tree. Uh, we used to make grids. New York and many other cities are simple grids. And we now make more often trees, where this is the interstate highway, and this is the big highway feeding into it, and this is the little road feeding into that, and this is the little tiny road that you actually have your house on, the little twig. And uh, if anything goes wrong anywhere in this system, everything is backed up. We had that experience driving over here this afternoon, in fact. Um, <laughs> any three blocks of the grid can take more traffic than the interstate highway. And if you come to a problem, you just turn left and turn right and go, go on your way. And it's pedestrian scaled, and you can walk anywhere. It's a much better idea uh, than the, and I think that's be, people are beginning to become aware of that because they're tearing down, tearing out interstate highways and uh, repurpose, replacing or repurposing the grid cities of the past. I love grids. I think grids are terrific. Uh, another, every time you see a pair of slides, every time you see a pair of slides, it's a new lecture. You have to get used to that. Um, this one is about, this is an automobile in which everything has been articulated, every little piece of it. Every, every change in the tires, any, every change in the headlights, every change in the grill, everything has been articulated. It is the opposite of this. This says one thing. It says uh, fast. Uh, everything has been, the, their hideaway windows and hideaway everything's. And uh, this, is a, this is an old slide. I could do a current one that would look much better, but it would be exactly the same thing. It's, uh, screw it. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying that when you look at a building, you may, might ask yourself, is it articulated in pieces, or is it sending one big so, so, solid message like, I'm, I'm streamlined, which is what the other one did. I love this car. It was never built, of course. It was just a drawing. Um, streamline. Here is a building by John Johansson, who was a prominent architect. It's, a, it's a, a library in a college in Massachusetts. And uh, Clark, University. Clark University, somebody's got it. Good for you. Uh, everything is articulated. Uh, here are the exhaust vents coming out from the air conditioning. Here are the little uh, uh, student carols, you know, where they study. Here are the bigger rooms for blah. This is a cardboard model that John Johansson made, but the building was built exactly that way. And when it was published, he said, what I was trying to do was show the back end of a, Vir of a Xerox machine. You look at the front end of a Xerox machine, it's all smooth and curved and shapey. Go around to the back and you can see the thing actually working. You can see all the little pieces. That's what I wanted to do. What I love about this is I was out at uh, Clark University for some reason and ran into a young woman student and asked her what she thought of the, what the students thought of the library. And she said, Oh, they laugh at it. They think it looks like the back end of a Xerox machine. <laughs> it's 
So that's again, a lot of messages, a, a, a social building that tells you from its, what it, what it tells you from its outside a little bit about what's going on inside and it's certainly, as someone said, humanly scaled. Uh, it's a little overdone maybe, it's a little uh, kind of a, a show off building, how many different things can we make happen here, sort of like that car. But it's a little more interesting than uh, this building, you can't see the floors, you can't see people working, you can't see the fact that the CEO is up here in double height spaces probably, and down below is a parking garage maybe, and you can't even get to the building except on the elevator, I don't know that, but it's, it's an example of a building that is one thing and one thing only, and what it is is this. It's just a plaque for the label. It has nothing to do with the people using it or, or working in it or building it or any of the rest of it. It has no relationship to anything around it. And uh, they can be beautiful. The John Hancock Tower, now known as 220 some street, but the John Hancock Tower by Harry Cobb in Boston is a beautiful example of that. It is architecture, it is sculpture. And if you do it that well. But Harry, the architect, partner of I.M. Pei, uh, he was asked by the, repeatedly by the Hancock people that they would like to have the John Hancock signature in neon across the top. <laughs> and uh, this architect, whom I admire for many reasons, but not least for this, simply never drew it and finally <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> another way of thinking about architecture, it's another pair. These, this is a row of condos in Finland. And each, 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 whoops, here I go again. Each two windows is an apartment unit, and they share a big lawn out here. The building is much longer than what I've shown. And it's a collective dwelling kind of attitude. Uh, we'll all share the same public space, and we won't care about the fact that we all look alike, because what's wrong with that? And then the opposite is, it would never happen in America. This is what happens in America. It's also a, a long a row of houses, two windows wide each. They're all identical, more or less. And uh, but one of them has got a totally phony kind of Georgian look to it, and another one has a phony kind of, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, but they're all, the point is Americans are individuals. We don't believe in those collective commie societies where everybody lives in the same white thing and they share the lawn. I'm, I'm not saying yay or nay. I hope, hope that's not what's coming across. I'm saying these are differences, complete differences worth thinking about. I obviously don't like this very much, but this could be very well done, too. Oh, I love this. This is a photograph by me of a gypsy colony in Spain. And it's a kind of a chalk-like, soft chalk-like rock, and they carve out caves. And then they, when they make their fires, they have to have chimneys. So you get the chimneys. So it's a, such a powerful image of a village, of a community of families. And again, in, this is in uh, uh, Newport, seen from the harbor. And it's the same thing. It reminds you that buildings are people, uh, just as this one did. they are people wearing costumes, but they're people. And the same thing here, all these eyes looking back at us at night, all these facial expressions. If you ask a child in any culture that I know of to draw a picture of a house, they will draw a picture with a peaked roof two windows for eyes, a door for a nose. You know, they'll make a human face out of it. I'm told that's true in other cultures. It's certainly true in our culture. Uh, Boston City Hall. I used to teach a course at the Harvard Graduate School of Design for outsiders, not for students of Harvard. And I would ask them every year to, what their favorite and least favorite building was in Boston. And Boston City Hall was the least favorite building year after year after year. Um, we were talking about it at dinner. I have a, a kind of love for it. It's not a wonderful building to walk inside and, and do your business in. Um, but it is a very, very powerful building. Uh, muscular, dramatic. It tells you I'm going to live forever. You're never going to be able to demolish me, which is turning out to be true. <laughs> and it has, a, it has a coded message. Oh, shit.
What did I do? <laughs> Somebody going to help me out? There you go. These are, my thumb is too big for the... Uh, yeah, use your pointer. Use your pointer here. I could do that, but I have to use... The, where would I... I could advance it where here. Keep going. Okay. Instructed to use my own pointer. Uh, the architect coded a message. In. <laughs> Too much technology. I've been arguing that from the beginning, haven't I? Ever since we talked about the Duke and the air conditioner. Um, there's a code here. This is the bureaucracy on these upper floors, looking more or less like what in those days was a punch card, you know, bank thing. Everything, everybody's interchangeable, everybody's anonymous, nobody has any personality, that's what, that's a bureaucracy. And then down below in the brick part of the building, uh, it reminds you that you're in Boston, that Fannel Hall is right here, it's made of brick. Beacon Hill is behind us, it's made of brick. And so the public services you want to get a dog license, you want to get a divorce, you want to get a driver's license, you want to pay a ticket, I guess, all those things. You, you deal with the brick lower building, which is supposed to remind you of the old city. And then in between, mediating between the bureaucrats and the public are the elected officials. And here's the city council, and here's the mayor, thrusting out with sort of... No one who has ever been, who has never been told that story by me or by the architect has ever recognized uh, that that was there. But, you know, I, I've said this at, at, at supper. I'll say the same thing again. There's nothing wrong with bad buildings. This is a wonderful, ugly building. You may have a wonderful, ugly uncle. You don't, you don't, dis you don't murder him. You adapt to him, and he adapts to you. Boston City Hall needs a lot of work. It needs to be brought up to standards of energy conservation and many, many other things. A lot of natural light ought to be uh, brought in. It could be brought in easily. All these things could be done very easily. But I, for me, it's a building that once was a palace. And uh, the, uh, the uh, bad people came and attacked the palace. The, the palace had tapestries and gardens and Lovely things all through it, you know. And uh, when it was attacked by the vandals or whoever they were, uh, they tore all that off and they took it away to their home, wherever they did, and they left the, the building as a kind of a raw skeleton of what it used to be. And I think that's the power of it. The power of it is, I used to be something, I could be again. And the architects would tell you the same thing. They say, we didn't have money enough to do good finishes. They say that, they may be exaggerating. And uh, they assumed that over time it would gather to become a kind of history of the city with tapestries and photographs and paintings and memorabilia of all kinds. And that's never been done. Um, but we live in a world now where so much energy, has, energy is at such cost. It took a lot of energy to build this, to clear the site in the first place. It was a lively part of the city. To build this building, it would take more to demolish it. It would take more energy to build a new building here. As the preservationists accurately say, the most energy efficient building is the one that's already built. Yay. Robert Venturi is a, a prominent architectural theorist, and this is his proposal for rebuilding Boston City Hall. How, how much simpler it could be. Um, he, it's what he called the, de the decorated box. You make the building out of a box, and then you use flashy graphics to tell you what it is and how wonderful it is. And as usual, he, Rob, Bob is, I'm sorry to say if any of you know him, not in good health at all. 
but he was tremendously influential in the late 1960s at sort of his critique of modernism. And he, he looked at pop architecture. This is like a McDonald's, right? Uh, a little box of a store and then a great big um, McDonald's emblem. I love this photograph. This photograph was given to me by one of the architects of Boston City Hall. I don't know where we are, but we're in Canada, so I was told. This is the town hall of a building in Canada. They demolished the old town hall, but they saved the Corinthian columns. <laughs> Talk about a box with a sign in front of it. <laughs> it has a certain ingenuity, doesn't it? So it's just a, an illustration of uh, Bob Venturi's. Um, I, I want to be sure we have time enough for questions. Tell, tell me when to shut up. <laughs> These go on forever. Who is the inhabitant of this space in Chicago? It's obviously the guy in the background. And I admire these people for their courage in walking toward that beast <laughs> that is obviously going to devour them. Uh, this is Alexander Calder. This is Mies van der Rohe. These are famous designers of the 20th century. I think it's an absolutely miserable place. Here we are in downtown Boston, an equally awful place. Now it's been uh, somewhat renovated. Uh, I had a wonderful experience at the American Academy in Rome for a few months, a few years ago. And uh, I was struck by the layering. And I saw that in this city, too. We, you have a wonderful downtown. We had, you, no, no, I know of no better downtown in America than the one you have. Uh, it goes on forever for a city. of You must have people coming in all the time to sort of populate these stores and offices. But I was at the American Academy in Rome, and there's a lot of graffiti in Rome, as there is in a lot of places. And I made a photograph of this one because I love the layered look of it. Um, one thing has been added to another, has been added to another, and the colors are all Italian. Uh, there's the, uh, well, there's a kind of a pale um, sepia that you get in Rome. You get a, a yellower one in Florence. You get a different one in Bologna, a darker one in Bologna. So you begin to get this layering up of different periods and different sites. And uh, it seems to me it's a wonderful image of the entire city. And I regret to say that I have heard, I haven't been back in Rome lately, maybe... Uh, Friends of ours could, someone else could tell me, that they are getting rid of this stuff. Uh, let me see what I have in the next one. Well, here's an example of that layering in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, there was a, uh, a shoemaker in this, in this space, and he got the Noman copy place, rented the whole thing. And I don't know whether you can see it, but it's an Art Nouveau architecture. You see all these curves and plant-like forms. It's almost the only Art Nouveau architecture in greater Boston. So all the preservationists and artistic people got together and said to Noman Copy, you've got this place, but you're not going to get rid of this facade. So Noman Copy just put its big sign one foot back. And I, I love this image. I would not do anything to improve this image. I would not restore the original uh, Art Nouveau. Um, I think here you, here you have the dormitories of Harvard Yard reflected in the windows, the big 60s graphics of, or 70s graphics of the Noman Copy Shop, and the, and the memory of the uh, shoemaker who's back there now, by the way, many years later. Um, how can you do any better than that? I have a friend, Rafael Maneo, who's probably the leading architect in Spain, and he said to me once, I've never seen a building addition I didn't like. I feel that way, too. I think... The way a city layers up over time is very, very valuable, and you certainly have that here. You have a few extraordinary houses that you might want to preserve, but it would not be appropriate to build an imitation of one of those houses of another era and another time. The left, left hand side seems to be on my side. <laughs> but here's the layer. In, in Rome, you, you used to be able to find a, a pizza shop with a couple of historic columns that had been fitted into the window or something. I think that's wonderful. Would you want to change that? Would you want to restore the historic temple or whatever was there once before? I think you don't do that. There's a wonderful, uh, great influence on me was Ada Louise Huxtable, the critic for the New York Times and the, and the Wall Street Journal. 
And she has a wonderful piece that I would bring me if I, if I thought of it, I would have brought if I thought of it. But she says, she was talking about a perfectly designed federal mansion by an architect in New York whom I, who's very good at doing that. And uh, she said, I am no fan of perfection. She was talking about Marblehead. She lived in Marblehead half of every year. And she talked about how it was built by a little bit, little bit of this and a little bit of that and some carpenter who found a book of English patterns and tried something but couldn't do, the, do, couldn't do it with the right materials, so changed the materials. And so you get this lovely talking kind of architecture, you know, telling you what was, what's, what happened to it, what's, what's there now. And I love that. I, I don't believe in an extreme aesthetic. Um, Ada Louise went so far as to say, and I think this I wouldn't probably agree with, she didn't like it when uh, homeowners who bought new brownstones uh, where the uh, stoop had been cut off long ago so that it could be used for some other purpose, she didn't like it when they restored the stoop and put it back on. She thought that was fake historicism. Uh, you can argue that one both ways, I think. Uh, again, a kind of layering. This is the Hancock Tower with the Trinity Church. So I'll try to another. This is a lovely example of what I'm talking about. I don't know where we are, but it was in some magazine. But you could spend all day trying to figure out what they built first, what they did with that afterwards, or was it this, or was it this, or was it this? Um, and how could it be improved? I don't see how it could be improved. It's, uh, but I, as I say, I'm told that the authorities uh, for touristic purposes in Rome are tending to uh, discourage those kind of things. Then there's the language of architecture that ordinary people speak, that architects, because they get into a private kind of uh, club of their own, ignore what people like. This is a house by Le Corbusier, the great French architect of the 20th century. This is what it looked like after a few owners had been uh, had passed through it. <laughs> Same house. Well, you ask yourself what they did, and you say, if I'm going to write a poem, I'm going to write it in English. I'm not going to read it, write it in Esperanto. But he wrote in Esperanto. What is this? The pit, pitched roof tells us that it's protecting us from the rain. The uh, visible chimneys tell us there's a fire inside. Uh, the window is exactly the height and width of a human being, as they often are. And so it's a kind of surrogate for the inhabitant who's inside. And so on and so on and so on. It's a, the application of a language of ordinary people to a language of architecture. I, I would like not to say which is better and which is worse. I, it's, a, it's an example. Um, uh, but I think it's a, a, an example that a lot can be learned from. My, what my, favorite, my favorite building... Uh, this, you all know this, of course, the world-famous open kitchen in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. It has just about everything. It has the masks of comedy and tragedy. It has the shutters to remind you that it's a domestic, I guess, although they wouldn't fill the window. It has the flags of all nations. It has a portcullis, that may, which is guarded by two soldiers. It has a, uh, uh, I don't know what this is, but it's some kind of, screen or something. Um, everything that you can imagine, I mean, to just hint at the the fireplace. Where's the fireplace? There is a fire. Here's the fireplace. To merely hint at the uh, joy of the dining experience that awaits you. Uh, I wouldn't tear it down. Uh, it's pretty, pretty ingenious. I mean, how crazy. Is there anything wrong with crazy? <laughs> no. If you get too much of it, it's not so good. Um, Peter and I, somebody mentioned, had used to do these old and new photographs of Boston. This is my favorite of all the ones we did. We're, on, uh, we're in the North End, and uh, th this, is, this guy had this photograph over his shop. This is his shop, Convenient Foods. And so they brought it out and held it in the middle of the street. And so the image that Peter, what Peter would do is take a photograph from exactly the same point of view, framing exactly the same set that uh, the original one was. So this photograph with this in it is, a, you know, contains within it the older photograph. And it's very, very interesting. Again, you learn so much about cities. You think the North End has been around for a while? These two townhouses are the only things that survived from the old new to the new, to the, from the old house to the, from the old street to the new street, Salem Street. That's all, everything else is new. 
And there's the interesting thing that uh, if you look closely at this one, there's a banner hanging across the street from one street to the other. And it has a photograph or an image in the middle of it. There it is. It's William McKinley, who has just died and been assassinated in my hometown of Buffalo. And they, that's why all these kids are so well-dressed in the North End, because they, uh, the, it, the, in, in the photograph, not, a, not in the new photograph, but in the old photograph. Um, and there, you, all the signs are in Yiddish or Hebrew. Um, and uh, there's a sense of, oh, how do I want to put it? How important it is to feel that you know where you've come. Architecture is about uh, time and place, telling you where you are in place and when you are in time. And both, both of those things are enormously important. And I think these photographs of which this, as I say, was my favorite. Oh, here's, here's the old one. So there's McKinley. So, and, and here's everybody dressed up, obviously, for some kind of ceremony, probably a religious ceremony. And here's the Hebrew lettering. And here are the two houses that have survived out of the, all this picture. Somebody going to tell me to shut up? I'll shut up if there's a if the. Uh, well, this is Frank Lloyd Wright again. A lot of you have been here. One of the great American buildings, Falling Water, a house that he did for the uh, Hoffman family in Pennsylvania. And what I want to point out is that yet another aspect of architecture is embedded here, which is that architecture begins with the earth and gradually ra rationalizes itself as it goes up until finally you get the chimney is all that's left of the stonework. And this all looks very modernist and very um, artificial, which it is. But it's what's interesting to me, there are a lot of wonderful things about this house, but what I like about it is that it seems to have grown like a tree out of the rocks to the smaller rocks to the yet smaller rocks to the chimney to the uh, uh, thin concrete walls up there. There's an, I'll tell you another story about uh, falling water if you're interested. Um, somebody, a friend of mine, pointed it out to me that if you go in the living room, there are four corners. You come in through a dark, moldy door. There's a fireplace in one corner. There's a stair to the, to the stream in another corner. And there's this door that opens to this, uh, this uh, cantilevered balcony. So there are four corners with four things on them. One of them is earth. One of them is fire. One of them is light. One of them is water. So the four basic, you know, that's typical of Frank Lloyd Wright. Would he have known he did it? I don't know. But it's wonderful. And here we have, uh, this is an equally beautiful piece of architecture. This is a, a chapel in uh, Korea that I happen to see. They've done it even more, even more in some ways better than he did. Here we are with the big rocks. Here are the smaller rocks getting more organized, getting more carved and more organized until finally you get up to the top, where everything that, everything that was massive stone at the bottom has become butterflies so light uh, up here at the top. It's a wonderful, it's a, just another way of thinking about architecture. Um, nobody recognizes this, I'm sure. This is Trinity Church in Boston. This is a hotel called the Hotel Westminster that occupied that site. And this had this uh, terracotta uh, imagery that always looks to me like a drug teenager, but I don't know what he's doing. Um, the Hotel Westminster was determined by the city of Boston to be about five feet taller than was allowed. And did, the, did they take a bribe? No, they did not take a bribe. They insisted on the upper floor being torn off. Mike, okay. There is the Hotel Westminster, and there is the floor that isn't there anymore. And it lived that way until for many years, until it was replaced by the building on the left, which is the Hancock Tower, which instead of violating a height limit of 95 feet is, viol is now 790 feet tall. Um, I love the Hancock Tower. It's like the Eiffel Tower, which was very unpopular when it opened. Some things you can only do once. This is one great skyscraper in Boston. I don't care if we never have another, and I think we could get equal density 
with uh, low-rise construction. I think everybody has proved that. I'm going to... There it is. It is beautiful. Steve Rosenthal photograph. Um, Steinberg, the cartoonist, had figured out the Hancock Tower before it was built, and he realized what the problems were going to be, that there would be a lot of crap up on the roof, which there is, and there would be a problem with the entrance. How do you make an entrance into a 60-story mirror? Not easy. And there would be a problem of relationship, perhaps. <laughs> well, I, I asked Terry, the architect, about this, and he said, well, what he would like to have done was he would have entered Trinity Church, which is over here, and gone to the crossing. And there would be an escalator at the crossing that would take you down one level. And you would then come through a tunnel uh, and em emerge within the un inviolate sort of 60-story tower. There would be no, no entrance. You would just come from inside. Every architect I know has a theory about that. My theory was that you would go into the army, to the Pentagon, and rent a... Uh, uh, a Sherman tank, and you would build the entire building without an entrance, and then you would position the tank across the street and drive into the lobby, sweep up, and you would have created the only logical entrance to a 60-story mirror. <laughs> this is what people thought Copley Square was going to look like. Here's the Hotel Westminster. Here's Trinity Church, of course. This imagined future that everything was going to be mobile, there were going to be a million different kinds of uh, ways of getting around, uh, images like this were common in the 1920s when there was great, I even remember in my father how excited he was when he got a new car, you know, every three years or something like that. With, and and it, uh, for that generation, it was everything that the cell phone is today. It was exciting. Didn't work out very well. Here's the real world that the automobile created. We're in California, Sherman Oaks. Uh, here I am in a car. Uh, it, and I said, sometimes people do plant trees. That sort of so solves everything, doesn't it? <laughs> I think I will cut out, and because uh, these go on forever. And I think we've had enough. Thank you very much. But let's have quick Q and A. We good? There we go. Thank you. I do apologize for my ineptness at dealing with technology, but I make a point of continuing to do that so as to give my son all the chances he needs to <laughs> triumph over me. It's important for his psychological health. <laughs> Comments, questions, diatribes, sermons, whatever. Nobody ever wants to do the first question, so let's begin with the second question. There it is. <laughs> So when is it okay to make an aesthetic statement, just a piece of art that happens to be maybe a new expression or just something beautiful? And it is not necessarily about a common sense urban dwelling place. When do you do that? You do that when the program justifies that the program being the purpose of the building. Uh, if it's Saint chapelle you know, I, I don't care if there's anything around it. It's perfect. It's, it's what it should be. Um, but you do that only, I think. You don't, if you do a lot of those, you get a World's Fair. You get just too many things jumbled together, all competing with each other, no matter how good they are. But I think when you have an appropriate use for the building, and appropriate in every way, you know, then that's appropriate to do that. That's what I said about the Hancock Tower. I wouldn't want it to be a model for everybody else, but I think it's a marvelous building. Can we have more light? Um, just out of curiosity, what do you think of the um, entrance of the Apple Store in New York 
that was done almost as a copy of the museum in Paris, I think, a little bit. You mean of the pyramid in Paris? Yes, sir. Well, they were totally different architects. I, I, I was not aware, I'd never thought of that before. I think the pyramid in Paris is, from a practical point of view, a complete disaster. You stand in line in the rain, you know, you get inside and the sun glares down through that glass. You have to go down a twisty little stair or, or an, es an escalator to get down and you find yourself in a sort of basement. I don't think anything about it is good. And yet it has become a very important symbol of Paris and everybody who buys, buys a postcard buys a postcard of it. I think it, the, the, uh, the one in New York is much better. I think it's fine. Uh, it's a lovely little thing. Uh, it's, a, it's what you might call a, uh, what's the word for it, where people on English estates used to make little pavilions just for, just to, folly. folly. It's a folly. It's a folly in the city. And I think it's uh, beautifully, beautifully put together and beautifully done. And so I'm for it. I also have an apple myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question, which is, um, is what's good for New York and Boston uh, this good for smaller cities like Portsmouth? No, no, I don't think so. Um, it's another lecture, but I, th I think the small city is the future of America. Uh, I think a lot of them are coming back that were, were depopulated by the departure of manufacturing or whatever, and they're coming back as places to live, and they're wonderful places to live. And I think the small city should remain a small city and uh, maintain, uh, it's certainly okay to increase density. Increase density, people don't like the word density, but they don't get it accurately, I think. Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Somerville next door to it were in a study that was done about 1990, the two most densely populated cities in the entire United States. Try to buy a condo in either of them today. They're very, very successful. High densities are not a problem. High buildings may be, big buildings may be, other problems may be, but density is not a problem. The most densely populated city in the Western Hemisphere is Paris, one of the, one, one of the ones we think of as most beautiful. So I think I would, Say yes. Keep it a keep it a medium-sized city. Think about what its real characteristics are. Like you, we were doing this afternoon, traveling around, and uh, try to maintain that order, but don't copy it. Yeah, someone right. How do you, most people seem to really like traditional architecture, and yeah, got to use the mic. Well, I really have a two-part two question. Most people seem to really like traditional architecture, mm -hmm. including a lot of contemporary architects who choose to live in traditional style houses. Um, so two questions. What is the antidote or the hope for better architecture, both large public and everyday architecture, um, when the Architecture Academy is still, for some strange reason, still um, in fealty to the discredited modernism, the notion that, you know, the, uh, the Howard Rourke, I've got to be a genius and produce my, my brilliant piece of sculpture, even if it doesn't fit in. When the- After I finished raping my friend. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so that, that's my first question. And then the second one is, um, what is your sense about what is, what is good architecture? How do you find that balance between something that is traditional and recognizes the wonderful time-honored principles, but does it have to be original? Does it have to speak of its time? Um, if it speaks of its time, it'll be um, 10 years later out of, out of time. It won't be speaking of the time anymore. The problem with architecture as an artist is that it la the buildings last so long. You, it's not like paintings and fashion models and things like that where you can change styles every year or two. You can't do that with architecture because you build what you build and it costs a lot of money. The answer to your question, I don't, I don't know how to make it happen, but I think the answer to your question is you need a consensus. If everybody agrees on what good architecture is, then the developers will be willing to pay for it and the public will like it. And there are architects more and more and more now, I think, who have nothing to do with that, as you accurately said, that kind of architectural cult of avant-gardism. I think avant-gardism was the, was the great crime of the 20th century in every field. Uh, you can't value things by whether they're pointing to the future because nobody knows the future. Um, Bill Ron is an architect in Boston whom I often use as an example, and I, he'd be embarrassed for me 
to, to do this, but he seems to find a way to do buildings that are sufficiently um, contemporary. I wouldn't use the word modern, but contemporary. They, a building that you build today has to be contemporary because it's dealing with si issues of how do we construct, what kinds of uh, systems do we have, mechanical and whatnot, what kind of, uh, what materials are available, what kind of contractors, all of those things have to be dealt with by the person who's designing the building. So it can't not be contemporary. It can pretend not to be contemporary. But that's the phony building. I, I, I like... When you look at his, re, genuine historic architecture, and we were looking at a lot of today driving around, you have to remember that there was just as much ingenuity invested in architecture in those days as there is in contemporary architecture. They didn't just grow out of the ground like mushrooms. Somebody, and it was like the quote I made from Ada Louise Huxtable, somebody did the best they could under the circumstances they had to imitate, and they're really alive because of the changes. Like the one that we saw that had fake stone, you know, made out of stucco or something. Very common in those days because there was no stone to build with in New England um, except granite and, well, it's another story. <laughs> so that's my answer. We need a consensus and I think we're moving toward it, not away from it. Um, the love of the sort of 50s modern revival, which is everywhere in this country now, uh, seems to me to be an example of uh, a kind of coming together of new and old. I think it doesn't I think you can make a great building in any style. I don't think style is an issue. Um, but there are certainly great modern buildings. You wouldn't want to change the chapel at Ranchon or something like that. Yeah. You. Yes. The microphone is on its way. <laughs> so my question is, um, you can build a building in any style, but what creates the, the real, um, uh, the integrity to that building? Whether it improves. Because we've seen a lot of that in Portsmouth, there is no integrity. We have a lot of rectangular buildings that could be anywhere in any city that have nothing to do with what Portsmouth uh, well, I, I, really was. A lot of your old historic mansions are quadrangular or rectangular also. Um, I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't carry that kind of overall value into the situation. Rectangular buildings can be federal and Georgian and whatever. Um, so what people seem to dislike is anything that reminds them of uh, their parents' generation. <laughs> Boston City Hall is now a grandparents' generation building, and it's coming back into favor. Uh, I think the answer is, I hope, I, I hope it was what I was talking about all night, the building should make the place it's in a better place. That's the, and, and there are a lot of ways to do that and a lot of ways not to do it, but I think that would be move number one. Someone else? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> do you have any comments to make about constructing a whole bunch of new skyscrapers in Boston? There's a, a lot of new skyscrapers being built in Boston, terribly tall, taller than almost anything we have. Um, I'm amazed because uh, when I started writing two generations ago, I started writing in 73, I think, there was an, because of the uh, damage that had been done by the urban renewal movement in so many cities, uh, there was a hatred of tall buildings because tall buildings were what had replaced what was there before in so many cases. In places like San Francisco and Boston, the anti-high-rise movement was very powerful. Two generations later, I find younger people love high-rise buildings. They have no problem with them. I have no problem with them if they do what I just said to the other lady. Think of the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building. You can walk past them on the street, and all you're aware of is four or five stories of shops and offices. You don't even see the tower. And uh, then there are 100 floors or something of offices. And then when you get to the top, there's a kind of flag. You know, There's a kind of, uh, some kind of image. And I think, uh, how shall I put this? I think if a tower, the problem with an office tower is that it's the most boring program in the history of the world. I mean, hundreds of offices, you're going to make a building out of hundreds of offices? Come on. But you can, I think, find ways to dif differentiate that facade by setting it back, by changing it, by recognizing that the bosses live here and the ple plebs live here. There are a lot of ways you can do it, or by mat working with materials and different materials. Um, so I... Suspicious. I mean, 
When skyscrapers were terrible, it was because they were surrounded by parking lots, because that was how you got to them. And that was what Houston was like uh, 30 years ago. Um, I think today they don't provide much parking, and they assume that people will be able to get to them by walking from their homes because the cities are going to be more diverse and more mixed up with different activities. I think we're, going, we're seeing a lot of that. So if it's done well, it's fine with me. I don't think it's up to me to criticize whole building types. And I love the Chrysler building. I love the Empire State building. So does everybody. So what's wrong with tall buildings? Um, the uncle of my old boss, Jose Luis Sert, has murals still today in the lobby of the Chrysler building, going back to uh, 1930. So there's art. There's questions here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm wondering what kind of advice. I'm way over on this other side. On your. <laughs> You're a dark shadow. You're a silhouette. <laughs> um, I'm wondering what advice you would give to um, historic district commissions whose aim it is to protect an image of a city? Um, the advice I would give is uh, just use all your intelligence and all your sensitivity and be a very good person, and uh, you'll figure it out. <laughs> There's somebody back here. I, 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 I made it clear that I tend to like change. I tend to like things layering up. I tend to like the story having more than one chapter. And so I'm a little bored by Beacon Hill. Uh, which is a one I wouldn't, I don't mind that they have these extremely strict restrictions. You can't change the doorbell on your big Beacon Hill house. That seems a little silly to me. Uh, I like to see things change over time and be readable over time. And I think that uh, uh, Historic District Commission, I wrote, helped with Charles Sullivan, I helped write the one for the Mid Cambridge Neighborhood As Association, uh, which, we, which has been in force for a long time. And it's very, it, it's, you know, it has vague language in it, like uh, human scale. Who knows what human scale is? All you can do is trust your, trust what you see. It's like any other critic. It's like a critic of poetry. Um, you have to trust. If, if it says that uh, all swans are black, then you better believe that all swans are black. That, that really made no sense at all. But I, <laughs> I was quoting something that was irrelevant. But I, think, I don't think there's any, there's no clear-cut advice. Just be the most humane and sensitive person. Listen to everybody who's got something to say. Don't let yourself be browbeaten by developers or bankers or anyone else who's not part of that neighborhood. All of those issues, I think, are pretty obvious. But I don't think, I don't believe in hard and fast rules. I was wondering if you could explain, no, I won't put it that way. Could you tell me what your thoughts are on the... Uh, I shouldn't talk about the gardener because I was a member of the building committee <laughs> and worked on it with uh, Renzo Piano and others for 12 years before, I mean, in his case, for about seven or eight years. Um, in general, I like it very much. Everybody I know has this or that little crit of it, and I do too, but I think it's worked very well. I think the old gardener museum, um, what we worried about, the addition was that we would lose the experience of the explosion of the atrium when you came in the door of the old uh, Gardner Museum. And everybody was very, very conscious of that. I think where you come in now, you don't have the suddenness of that explosion, but as you walk along, the atrium garden unfolds next to you. I think it's wonderful. I think it's, I think it's fine. Do you like it? If not, why not? Uh, she did want, would have wanted to preserve it much more accurately. The problem is that uh, the trustees, including the director, Ann Hawley, who was wonderful, uh, chose to decide that they wanted it to be a public museum. In M Mrs. Gardner's day, it had a couple of hundred visitors a year, I think a couple of thousand. Now it's 200,000 or something like that. 
if you're going to make it a public museum, you had to add some services. You had to add a concert hall. You had to add a temporary exhibition gallery. You had to have offices. People were working out of broom closets in, on the staff in the old Garden Museum. So the, what you're arguing against is not the quality of what was there, and you certainly shouldn't have seen a dumpster. I've never seen a dumpster. Um, and I think the experience of moving from the new part to the old part where you go through that, uh, what would you call it? Well, I'll tell you what Renzo called it. He called it the umbilical cord that attaches the new building to the old building where it's like walking along a hedge, you know, and suddenly you come to the old museum. I think it, I think it works very well. I think the redoing of the, of the monk's garden uh, on the side of the building, which was done by Michael van Valkenburg, one of the great landscape architects, is a masterpiece. They could have restored Mrs. Gardner's, and it was Anne Hawley's decision not to do that, but to do a contemporary garden, and it's... A, Unbelievable, it's wonderful. So I'm okay with it. But you, you have said something that a certain number of people do say, but it couldn't have gone on. When I was first hired by them as a consultant and we had a meeting of what, what should we do about the gardener and we looked at all the circumstances and I said, I think other people were thinking the same thing, but I think I said it. I said, you, you can't go on the way you are now. Um, what did I say? <laughs> I don't know. I've forgotten it. But what, what they, could, they couldn't go on the way they were. Oh, I know. I said you can go on the way you are, and that doesn't work. The two things you can do are revert to Mrs. Gardner's original concept, get rid of all the irrelevant stuff, bathrooms and everything, get rid of all of that, and make it once again. You have to probably take a ticket for six months to go in and all of that. You know, That would be one possibility. And the other one would be to do, you know, do something completely new. So there were three possibilities. One was to do something old. One was to do something new. One was to go on the way they were. And I presented that to them, and I said, the one thing you can't do is go on the way you are. It was hopeless. So to try to be a public museum under the circumstances that they were in was impossible. Question over here. Over here, Robert. Hi. I, I liked your comment about not murdering your crazy, ugly uncle. And I was curious about the uh, Boston City Hall and your, your liking layering. Are you suggesting that they should layer on top of the existing City Hall to make it more human scale, or would you suggest doing something more radical oh, I, with I don't, it? I, it? It is human scale. It's only five stories or something. Um, no, what I would do is add to both ends on the side. I think the pro one of the problems with City Hall is that it presents itself as a diva on the stage. Here I am, here's my stage. If you think of uh, Siena, which this plaza was modeled on, believe it or not, the town hall in Siena bumps into, joins with other buildings on both sides and they go on to create the circle of the uh, Piazza del Campo. Uh, that is what they should do, I think. If they want to expand, and they do, expand laterally and begin to activate that plaza and hopefully shrink it. It's much too big, except when the Bruins, every 50 years, win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> they always say, oh, it's great when there's a big celebration. Well, that's true, but it's not very often. I think it, I, ideally you would build, there's an outer row of buildings outside the street. There could be an inner row of buildings that would activate that space with their retail frontages or whatever and shrink it to the point where it wouldn't be so overwhelming. I don't think that's possible, but I think that's what should be done. Uh, there is a, a rule that uh, was announced to me by Edward Logue, who for many years was director of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He seemed to be the only one who knew it, that part of the deal that allowed the government center to be made that was fed, federal government funding um, under the Urban Renewal Codes, that uh, they, they had to promise that nothing would ever interrupt the view from the JFK building the building that, with the Twin Towers that uh, Walter Gropius was the architect on. It's a, not a very good building, but it would make it impossible to build anything in front of it, and that's been looked at several times and always fallen down. I'm talking too much. Yeah. So uh, another question here. Um, when Jeff Speck was here, he suggested that if we have a major redevelopment like at the Federal Building, mm -hmm. that multiple architects should um, be in work cooperatively on a design. What do you think of that idea? I don't think it's necessary, but I don't think it's bad. Um, when I, when, you know the Getty uh, Center in, La, in Los Angeles, you've probably mostly been there. 
I sat down there to have lunch with the architect, Richard Meyer, a couple of weeks before it opened. And they, he had designed the entire building, most of which nobody knew what was going to happen inside because they hadn't developed their programs yet. And so he sort of made Richard Meyer buildings, you know, that they fitted into somehow. And I said, Richard, suppose you had done a master plan. And then as each of these, there are five or six branches of the Getty, had come into existence with its own director and its own thought about program, and given that to a different architect working within your master plan, how would you have felt about that? It's what you're saying, pretty much. And it was the only time he didn't lie to me, I think. He looked at me and he said, if I hadn't got the job, I would have said the same thing. <laughs> I, 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 I have a lot of... of uh, I have a very high opinion of the guy you, you mentioned and the work that they're doing. Yeah, that's, that's maybe where the uh, form-based coding came from here, I would think, too. Um, I think it would solve the problem of getting some diversity, but I think one architect can do it, too. Um, this, this used to be a town uh, where many uh, different um, economic levels lived. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a great many hotels being built, um, and a large building that I guess, uh, perhaps it will be misuse. It's mostly apartments right mm -hmm. before you go over the bridge. Uh -huh. Um, do you think a town loses something when, um, it gradually pushes out? And certainly, I certainly do. I believe it very strongly, yeah. yeah. If you go to the Back Bay now, I mean, the, these things change so quickly. In 1970, the uh, census of 1970, the city census, I think fewer than 2% of the houses in the Back Bay were owner-occupied. They were occupied, they were standing room on uh, SRO apartments and student quarters and things like that. They were a slum, the Back Bay. Look at it today. But there's no useful service in the Back Bay anymore. You can't go to the hardware store, you can't go to the drug store, you can't go to, it's all gone, because nobody can afford it. It's all art galleries and things like that. That's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens is the people who provide services are forced out and have to make a long commute. If you go to a city like Atlanta, which is it's improving, but it's badly organized that way, uh, you, you can t I've done this. You talk to a woman on the bus stop, you know, and say, where'd you come from? Where are you going? She's going to a fancy house to clean it, you know, that's in the hour and the time from her own home to this could be two hours, you know, which would be maybe five to seven in the morning, something like that. I mean, it's totally outrageous. Um, I think it's, uh, we, we, we all need to know our fellow citizens and we all need to work with them, and I, I think it's terrible. It, in a capitalist democracy, which is what we have, it's very hard to do anything about that. People who have money have the right to buy property. So I don't know, you know how much can be done, but whatever can be done should be done. I think it's terrible. It's happening badly in Boston. Just a couple more questions? No more questions. Right. Thank you, uh, Robert Campbell. Thank everyone for coming. Feel free to hang around for a while. Uh, PS21 will have uh, its next event in January. It will be on the smart growth approach to affordable housing, uh, and they'll be in late January. And we've raised about uh, more than half the money for the program. If you're able to contribute or help out in some way, please let us know. Thank you very much. Very much.